Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to this Dean Eckenberg uh, poetry reading by Luba Yakimchuk. Uh, I'm Steve Ennis, director of the Harry Ransom Center, and we're very pleased to be co-sponsoring this reading with the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Uh, the reading will be followed by a book signing and reception, and I hope all of you will uh, plan to attend, and I know Luba will be happy to sign books for you at that time. Introducing our speaker um, this afternoon is the Ukrainian-born poet, novelist, and translator, Oksana Lushishina. Oksana's most recent novel, Ivan and Phoebe, received the Leave City of Literature UNESCO Prize and is forthcoming in an English translation. Her most recent collection of poems, Persephone Blues, is also soon to be out in an English translation. Please join me in welcoming Oksana to introduce Luba, our speaker tonight. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight uh, Luba Yakimchuk, who is one of the most influential Ukrainian poets at the moment. She comes from the city of Pervomaisk in the Lohan region, which is in the east of Ukraine. And uh, she is also the author of uh, plays, not just poetry. And she's a uh, her poetry has uh, received numerous accolades, in, in particular International Poetry Award by the Kovalev Foundation based in New York City. Uh, Luba uh, is the author of several full-length volumes of poetry. Uh, one of them is The Apricots of Donbass, uh, which has been translated into English and has been included uh, by Forbes Ukraine in the list of 10 top books about the war. And Luba herself has been listed uh, within top 100 Ukrainian artists uh, by um, New Time magazine in Ukraine. So, um, well, I turn the floor over to Luba and let's welcome her. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you for having me here. It's uh, an, honor, an honor for me to be here and uh, reading for you. Uh, talking about Ukrainian response to war, I have, I have to describe two types of narratives. Um, how Ukrainians um, response uh, <clears throat> To, to this ongoing war in Ukraine. The first narrative uh, is uh, a narrative of tragedy, and the narrative, uh, second narrative is a na narrative of comedy. I need to explain it because uh, uh, my poems, it's also part of Ukrainian narratives, and uh, talking about the first narrative. This is narrative about killing, fighting back, uh, uh, grief, anger, and rage. But second narrative, in, in, at the same time, um, it's about um, funny memes. Uh, we hear lots of jokes and stories about ongoing war in Ukraine. <clears throat> it looks like Ukrainians are fighting this war very easily, maybe optimistically, in a vital uh, way. <clears throat> Uh, now the Russians are destroying the Ukrainian uh, electricity infrastructure, probably you uh, read it in news, and Ukrainians are sitting without electricity right now um, for six or eight, eight hours every day. And uh, do you know what Ukrainians say? Uh, we will make love and mate babies during a blackout. <laughs> this is like a common response. Uh, to this blackout right now. I read this just on f Facebook. <clears throat> and uh, uh, one more staten statement about this blackout is also, it's better to live without electricity all winter th than to live with Russians all your life. Th that's also true. <laughs> Actually, uh, these jokes, uh, this everything helps us to live without fatigue 
and to fight uh, for our freedom as long as necessary. <coughs> and uh, um, my poems um, usually based uh, are usually based on real stories uh, that happens in um, in Ukraine, especially. Uh, the first one I'm going to read for you is based uh, uh, on a real story that happened in my city, Pervomaisk. <coughs> this city has been occupied uh, by the Russians since 2014. And uh, my whole family moved uh, from uh, the eastern part of Ukraine to the central part of Ukraine. And now Russian soldiers live in my family house, but it, it isn't about this. This poem isn't about this story. I'm good. Uh, this is about another one which happened in Pervomaisk, and I'm going to read this poem in Ukrainian to give you feeling of Ukrainian language and then in English. <coughs> this poem of old age. With starosti. Померли дід і баба, в один день померли, в одну годину, в одну хвилину. Люди говорили ще від старості. Здохла їхня курка, їхня коза та собака, а кішки не було вдома, і люди говорили ще від старості. Розвалилась їхня хата, сарай став руїною, і погріб зверху присипала землею. Люди говорили, що від старості розвалились. Прийшли їхні діти ховати діда з бабою. Оля була вагітна, Сергій був п'яний, а Соня мала три рочки. І вони теж померли, а люди говорили, що від старості. Холодний вітер обірвав жовте листя і поховав під ним. Діда, бабу, Олю, Сергія, Соню, які померли від старості. <clears throat> and in English, of old age. An old man and old woman died on the same day, on the same hour, on the same minute. People said they died of old age. Their hand died, as died her God and their dog, but the cat wasn't home, and people said they died of old age. Their house fell apart, their shed turned into a ruin, the cellar was powdered over the dust. People said they were just too old. Their, chicken came to, they, their children came to bury the old man and the old woman. Ola was pregnant, Sergei was drunk, Sonia was only three, and they died too, and people said, they had died of old age. A cold wind plucked off the yellow leaves and buried under them the old man, the old woman, Olya, Serhii and Sonia, who all died of old age. <coughs> the next poem is about uh, what uh, can, happen, uh, can happen if people don't call a um, spade a spade. Uh, by its right uh, or proper name. And this uh, poem, I have a crisis for you. <clears throat> you lit up a cigarette, but it wouldn't burn. It was summer and girls would light up from any passerby, but I didn't light up from you anymore. Our law gone missing, I explained to a friend. It vanished. In one of the wars we reached in our kitchen. Change the word war to crisis, he suggests. Because a crisis is something everyone has from time to time. Remember, the second word crisis. Correspondingly, also the first word, civil crisis to each his own. I forgot about cold, cold crisis. It seems they also came in twos. Also the uprising crisis, it sounds so good. The uprising crisis of 1648-1657. Write it down in the textbooks 
a crisis that liberates, releases forever. My great-grandfather felt in the Second World Crisis, possibly by the hand of my other great-father, grandfather, or his machine gun, or his battle tank, but it isn't, uh, it, it, but it, it is unclear how they conducted this crisis with, with each other. Perhaps it was the crisis itself that killed them like a pleach, like a plague. For nobody is to blame for the crisis. It is unexorable like death. And when our own domestic war turns into crisis, goes it get better? D does it get better? Does it hurt less? Do birds come back to us from the south or maybe we come out to meet them? Why is our language like that? We lack words to describe our feelings. Only crisis and love are left as antonyms. As antonyms. But, it but if love is bound to be so complicated with these blazes and smoldering like blood and pain, and blood is not like a period, but some new feeling of mine and pain is yours, if love is made up of two different feelings, then soon love will also be called crisis. I have a crisis for you, darling. Let's get married. It will be easier for us both. We've got a crisis. We'd better split up. I need some water. I have to mention this poem was translated by Svetlana Lavochkina and uh, uh, my book, uh, Apricots All of Donbass, uh, were translated by Svetlana and also by Max Oksana Maximchuk and uh, uh, Max Rosochinsky. <coughs> and the next poem I'm, I'm going to read, it's Knife. <coughs> this is like, um, this is a very common situation. It's like picture of occup occupation of occupied city. Knife. <clears throat> with relatives we share a table and graves, with enemies only graves. One such candidate comes to share a grave with me, says to me, I'm bigger than you, I'm harder than you, I'm tougher than you, sticks knife after knife into my stomach and below knife after knife. His pressure spring like, but he is smaller than us. He is softer than us because he's only got one knife and there are plenty of us at the table and each has their own butt and each has their own cut. Says to me, I'm sharper bl blade cut you I'm thicker blade cut you. Chip chop, chip chop, the last one is dead. Hold on, they say, hold on. And we hold onto our table from the gun muzzle. We all drink our bullets. We pour in our enemy one, two. As, I, as you can already notice, I believe so. I'm writing about civilians during ongoing war because this is a genocidal war and uh, civilians need to have their voices and um, they suffer maybe the most because of this war. You know it's it's uneasy to read and I cannot see your faces and I don't know about your uh, how How's your reaction? <laughs> Thank you. We can imagine you are in Ukraine, blackout, like dark <laughs> part of this. <laughs> but
but I am in, uh, in the USA and I'm reading for you. But you can like, feel yourself like you are in Ukraine. And uh, these stories are, these poems are about you and also about everybody, everybody I believe. <coughs> Uh, the second poem is uh, a caterpillar. Caterpillar. Her digits contract in the coat. A wedding band slips off her ring finger. It clings and rolls on the pavement. Her hands tremble like leaves as a caterpillar draws near its track, crawls by the daughter's feet and stops. To man approach, order her to open her hands as if for a clap. They peer into her passport, pass it between themselves. They press and squeeze her thumbs on her index finger. They locate a burn instead of callous from shooting a sniper rifle. They call her by her nickname, or maybe it's someone else's, Butch. They strip her, they prop her, they lay her down, enter her, cursing. Nine of them, her favorite number, wearing blue bass robes, her favorite color, second-hand Nikes, her favorite shoes. Nine of them, for one, disheveled. Not a bitch, but a woman. Her little girl curls up like a fetus, looks on without tears. She picks up her mom's wedding band, holds in in her mouth like a dog with a bone, and watches a caterpillar devour their green city. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the next poem, it's um, decomposition. This is actually was unexpected for me uh, that such kind of poem can be uh, so, so understandable for many people uh, because um, I thought it's a little bit tough. And uh, I, uh, I wrote it like a post like Facebook post, something like this. And the composition, this is like kind of my program poem maybe. <coughs> so the composition. Nothing changes on the Eastern Front. Well, I had it up to here. At the moment of death, metal gets hot and people get cold. Don't talk me about Luhansk. It's long since turned into Hansk. Lu had been raised to the ground, to the crimson pavement. My friends are held hostage and I can't reach them. I can't do Netsk to pull them out of the basement from under the rubble. Yet here you are, writing poems, ideally smooth poems, high-minded, gilded poems, beautiful as embroidery. There is no poetry about war, just decomposition. Only letters remain, and they all make a single sound. Pervomysk has been split into pervo and maisk into particles in primeval flux. War is over again, yet peace has not come. And where is my deb alt evo? No poet will be born there again. No human being. I stare into the horizon. It has narrowed into a triangle. Some flowers dip their heads in the field black and dried out, like me. I have gotten so very old. 
no longer Luba, just Eba. And um, uh, next poem I'm, I'm going to read, it's Crow Wheels. Also now it's like common situation. It was uh, written before uh, this um, full-scale invasion, but it's like very common for nowadays Ukraine. <coughs> when the city was destroyed, they started fighting over the cemetery. It was right before Easter wooden crosses over the freshly dug graves put out their paper, paper blossoms red, blue, yellow, neon green, orange, raspberry pink. Joyful relatives poured vodka for themselves and for dead straight into their graves. And the dead asked for more and more and more and their relatives kept pouring. The carnival went on, went on. But at some point, a young man set off a trip wire at the grave of his mother-in-law. An old man gazed into the sky and lost it forever. A fat man smashed his shot glass. On the fence around his wife's grave, glass fell at his feet like hail. Easter came. Now a little crow sits on the grave of Anna Andreevna Ravenova. Instead of headstone, BTR 80 wheels. Rest at the cemetery nest of the Kolesnik family, where lie buried Maria Viktorovna, Pilip Vasilievich, and Mikola Pilipovich. What are they to me, those wheels and that crow? I can no longer remember. Uh, so it was like <coughs> this sad part of reading and this uh, sad and sometimes uh, kind of like, like a kind of tragedy, a narrative of tragedy, yes. Uh, but we also, um, have another part and um, you know I, I want to share something with you six years ago I was here in the USA and uh, then it took and then I took a direct flight uh, from Kiev to get here and cu currently there are no flight anymore in Ukraine and uh, also uh, you know uh, this is because um, Russian soldiers bring to, uh, bring to Ukraine their Russian archaic culture. Uh, they uh, actually they uh, act in Ukraine like uh, they already accustomed to act. To act. Uh, they uh, you, you probably heard about these gang rapes about people abduction, it's already for 400 children uh, were uh, deported from Ukraine to Russia and they continue to do it. Uh, probably heard about they not using toilet uh, when they uh, stay in Ukrainian houses. Um, killing civilian and even domestic animals and uh, burning Ukrainian books and uh, uh, destroying cultural institutions, uh, universities and so on. And even brainwashed uh, our children on occupied territories and this is also awful. I read today an article about this situation on Kherson Oblast, in Kherson Oblast. I believe they uh, bring to Ukraine their own culture and um, 
it's not some kind of unusual uh, behavior for Russian uh, soldiers on the territory of Ukraine. When they return uh, to Russia, they rape Russian uh, women along the way. And uh, there is evidence of rape in uh, Bel Belgorodska Oblast. This is a kind of um, like normal household and uh, of overall culture for Russians. Uh, but uh, Ukrainian resistance is already uh, uh, known in the world. I, you probably heard lots of stories with jokes and so on. <clears throat> and uh, I also want to show, to share with you this vital narrative in literature, in my poems. And um, I am I am just a part of this narrative. Uh, uh, this is like narrative of, of Ukraine. <coughs> so I need water a little bit. <coughs> uh, so the next poem is Unshaven Leg. <coughs> I shaved my right leg but forgot to shave the left leg. Habitually, I put on a white blouse, a short skirt, black earrings, red lips, and went to a work meeting. Sat down and cross my right leg over my left, the shaved leg on the unshaved. Oh, but you are a feminist, they whispered to me. I see your legs are unshaven. Dear colleagues, let's be fair. My right leg is shaved, but my left leg is not. Hence, you can't possibly say that both, both of my legs are unshaven. Black hair sticks on my left leg, but my right leg is fully all right. One leg is feminist and hairy indeed, but the other one is patriarchal and silky. It really is. How can you combine that, some women say, hurt? How can you walk about like that, some women say, bemused? Back home, I tell all this to my lover with my legs crossed. The feminist over the patriarchal and then the other way around, the patriarchal over the feminist. And my lover kneels before me, kisses my legs and whispers, but I love you both, shaven and I shaven, as well as half shaven and stark naked. <clears throat> and um, next poem is, um, such people are called naked again. Um, I'm talking about kind of love during war and you know this feeling that you feel this like more, this is more f like full, m full emotion, like you feel this You will see the same poem. Such people are called naked. <clears throat> you took off your t-shirt. I pulled off my dress. You un unbuckled your belt. I unhooked my brazier. You let down your pants and kicked off your socks. I freed myself all out of my panties so scanty that I better call them scanties. And now we lie in a bed, in, in bed, two strips, like two white bread loaves facing each other. You touch my cheek with your hand. You, you run your hand, uh, hand lower down my neck. You trace my uh, collarbones with your fingers. How nicely everything is made here, you utter, 
but suddenly from behind your shoulder, your mom peeks out and says, Andrusha, did you wash your hands? You turn to face her, show your hands and offer you, uh, and she offers you fruit compote and goes to the kitchen. You turn back to me. Put your hand back where you, get, uh, you, go, you got interrupted. From the collarbone, it slides down to my breasts, softly as she sent. And there, I feel my dad's breath on my nape. nape. Think, think with your head, child, he whispered loudly. I turn away from you and see his unshaven face very close and reply that I always think with my head. I turn back to you and now my hand slides along your chest and its downy hair bends under it. And now behind your back, the, beds, uh, the bed creaks. Andrusha, have, have uh, some fruit compote. You turn away from me, kiss her and say, Mom, I want to be alone for a little while. And she replies, offended, it doesn't look like you are alone. <laughs> and she goes off again. And now you are with me again and your hand on my stomach glides slowly down and it gets close and tender so it gets so, and now I heard my grandmother go, going in. She says behind my back, I knew it, you are not a virgin anymore. See how your look changed. And I take your hands off my belly, turn halfway to my granny with your hand. I straighten out her purple kerchief and say, in a loud voice, I'm still a virgin man and I will remain untouched forever. I turn back to you and here over your shoulder, an old lady in a yellow kerchief peeps out this time your granny. What female names end in a, a consonant as if it were a man's? She asks. The answer is mine but I keep quiet and take your hands off my hips. Slow falls between us and like two toy soldier, soldiers, we lie like this till morning. And in the morning, a cleaning lady comes, shows away the snow mounds between us. And I look into your green eyes for a long, long time and you look at my brown nipples for very long, then say, let's get undressed. And one by one, I take up off my dad, my grandma, my mom, my sister, and you take off one by one, your mom, your brother, your childhood friend, your pickup coach, and we are bar bare now, wearing nothing at all. Such people are caught naked. Thank you. And I believe we can start already our Q&A session. Yes, and I want to introduce Oksana. Because without Oksana, I cannot. <laughs> Act. Uh, yes, we can uh, relocate to mm -hmm. here and uh, I will be helping in case we need to translate something and I will ask the first question to uh, get us uh, started. Uh, so one thing to uh, to start with that I would like to mention is that every poet uh, this time in Ukraine finds themselves to be a little bit more than a poet, uh, but also an activist like Luba is, and Luba is actually a performer as well because she performed, she was the first poet ever to perform at the Grannies this year with 
uh, John Legend, who wrote a song dedicated to Ukraine. Um, and so each poet becomes an advocate who kind of goes around uh, explaining things about what's actually going on. So I wanted to ask a question about uh, uh, this um, concept of Ukrainian East, which has been uh, uh, stereotyped quite a bit. Uh, so how do you deal with these stereotypes? How do you break them? And also I cannot help but notice that your book is titled The Apricots of Donbass. It is not titled The Mines of Donbass or The Coal of Donbass, which is what we usually associate Donbass with due to these stereotypes. Uh, and maybe you will have also an opportunity to ask me about something and you can just prepare it. <coughs> um, maybe I will answer in Ukrainian to be uh, precise. And okay. Oksana will translate, okay? Sure. Um, so if we are talking about stereotypes. Oh, it's so <laughs> <laughs> interesting, okay? <laughs> like, <coughs> То Донбас асоціювався переважно з промисловістю з машинами. Донбас was associated with industry and the machines. І також це, зокрема, стало причиною накидувати на Донбас інші стереотипи, які були вигідні. In particular, that stereotype kind of opened up a way for other stereotypes that was then piled upon this concept of Донбас. А зокрема стереотипи про те, що Донбас не мислить себе як частину України, itself as the part of Ukraine because it's not really Ukraine. Або що Донбас це тільки російськомовний регіон, speaking region. Але все це неправда. But that's actually not true and І я я виросла в Донбасі, я там народилася. I grew up in the Donbas. I was born there. Я пам'ятаю 91-й рік. And I remember 1991. Я ще не пішла тоді до школи, я була I was not even in school yet. Я пішла тоді в 92-му. I started in 1992. Але я пам'ятаю, як мої батьки збиралися на референдум голосувати за незалежність України. But I remember how my parents were preparing to go vote at the referendum for the independence of Ukraine. І я пам'ятаю, що мій батько, а він шахтар, він вважав себе співавтором he considered himself very much pro-independence and actually somebody who authored it almost. Тому що українська незалежність, вона, зокрема, підштовхнула до цих процесів, до розпаду Союзу, підштовхнули шахтарські страйки. Because the miners were instrumental in that moment of beginning of people actually fighting for independence and starting the movement towards independence. Щодо російської мови, також, якщо ми подивимося на міста, то так, в містах переважає російська мова. It's true, Russian-speaking world is dominated there, dominating there. Якщо ми подивимося на села, то так, там переважає українська мова, тобто говірка української мови. But if we look at the villages or smaller towns, we can see that they are Ukrainian-speaking mostly, sometimes dialectal, but Ukrainian. Я народилася в російськомовній родині, але я вибрала для себе українську мову як мову, якою я пишу. I was born in a Russian-speaking family, but I made a conscious choice to write in Ukrainian when I started writing. Чому? Тому що для мене було набагато легше виразити себе українською мовою. Коли я пробувала писати російською, мені весь час здавалося, що я фальшива. Тому що є така строга кореляція між українською мовою, українською культурою і українською реальністю. Because there is a very strong correlation between Ukrainian language and the culture that surrounds you at that time. І та реальність, яка є в Україні. And that reality that we have in Ukraine. Про неї навіть простіше, легше писати українською мовою. And it's much more natural and easier to write about it in Ukrainian. Добре, говорячи про стереотипи, я розуміла, що нам в українській літературі бракує такого окремого наративу, щоб стосувався Сходу України і Донбасу, зокрема. Ми маємо певний наратив, який відбувається з Донбасом і з Україною і з Донбасом. І тоді я вирішила працювати з цією темою. 
ну, був, були процеси, які мене обурили, звичайно, все не так просто відбувається. Я написала поему Абрикоси Донбасу. Мото до якої є, там, де не ростуть абрикоси, починається Росія. And the motto there included in there is that uh, whenever, wherever the apricots are not growing, that's where we have the beginning of Russia. So apricots stop the border. That's true. <laughs> it's an interesting thing, that's true. Я хотіла зробити ці абрикоси також символом Донбасу. To make these apricots the, sort of the symbol here. Говорячи про абрикоси, це правда, коли ми перетинаємо кордон України з Росією, абрикоси зникають, абрикоси посадки. І коли я була дитиною, в 90-ті роки це дуже такі бідні роки в Україні. Ми збирали ці дикі абрикоси і виносили їх продавати на поїзд до Москви. Тому що в Москві теж немає абрикоси. І зараз, коли це східна частина України і південна частина України, абрикоси, абрикоси продовжують бути кордоном України. Абрикоси продовжують бути кордоном України, абрикоси продовжують бути кордоном України, абрикоси продовжують бути кордоном України. І це спосіб, у який ми можемо показати те, що нам нічого ми не зробимо. Ми ніколи не здамося, ми не здамося. Тому що у нас є ці абрикоси. Um, I will repeat the question for uh, the people who are watching us on Zoom. Um, they will, might not hear the audience. So uh, where do you see Ukraine and yourself in five or ten years from now, all things considered? So that the bachelors, could they move here? Must they move to the next five or ten years? Or will they stay in the same place? I believe Ukraine will be a strong state, independent state, of course. And, um, Uh, I believe also you will know more about Ukla Ukrainian culture because the situation on front line is strongly connected with the uh, um, situation in, in culture. And um, uh, culture uh, also react on this situation. And uh, we see, um, I see actually, I travel a lot uh, with poems, uh, with uh, discussions, Uh, with the discussion panels and uh, um, you uh, and and I see how this interest for Ukraine is growing for Ukrainian culture and um, this is also like this is also very good of course we know like bad part of parts of this war Uh, but also we know that there is some uh, good things in this war. And this is anti-imperialistic war and we fight with uh, Russian like empire, like uh, a point of us, uh, point of view on us. And uh, this is really essential for us to be um, not object but subject. Uh, to be independent and uh, to act like independent state and uh, uh, to be considered like independent state. That's all. Very family 
Yeah, but it's on the Would you, over Yeah, so I, I'll repeat the question again. So um, uh, the question was about reading in second language and also uh, about some stereotypes about Ukrainians. Perhaps it's a stereotype that basically uh, everywhere we hear that Ukrainians are very family oriented, but Luba's last poem seemed a little bit uh, more risky, so how would she <laughs> comment on this? So, in that sense, that Ukrainians on the television, on the radio, it seems that they are very focused on the family, but in that sense, they are not more conservative people. But the last one that I read, he was not in that way, and maybe you can comment on it. I'm not worried about my grandma. He doesn't think about his grandmother. Well, there are different people, just like uh, every nation has all kinds of folks. Uh, some are more conservative, some are less conservative, perhaps. Звичайно, що поети – це менш консервативні люди, і вони пишуть всяке таке обурливе. Щодо цих віршів, мені подобається працювати з нашими комплексами. З тим, людей на нас. Оксана, це трансліт. That's because I hear your thought. I don't hear what you're yeah. saying. <laughs> it's amazing. That's what that's what we do in Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unity. <laughs> Go ahead. Так. І мені дуже подобаються ці теми. Мені подобається роботи працювати з тим. I like working with the що нам заважає жити в певному сенсі, що нас гальмує. With things that actually slow us down, things that prevent us from having a full life. І в літературі я можу зробити багато чого, чого я не можу зробити в житті. And in literature I can do many things that I cannot do in real life. В літературі я можу показувати такі от інтимні сцени. These kinds of intimate scenes. Я можу перемагати ворогів і навіть їх бивати. I can win over my enemies and even kill them. І мені подобається ця влада літератури. I like this power that literature grants us. Тому що вона мені дозволяє робити все, що я хочу. It allows me to do whatever I want. So how has the war changed your process of writing? Як війна змінила твій підхід, твій процес писання? Це дуже таке об'ємне запитання. That's really a very multifaceted question. Я можу на цю тему прочитати цілу лекцію. I could probably have a whole lecture just based on this. Але обмежуюсь основними пунктами. Основне, що зробила війна, вона змінила мову. So the main thing that war did, it changed the language. Мова – це така річ, яка завжди рефлексує реальність. Language is something that we use to reflect upon the reality. І коли реальність довкола нас дуже стрімко змінюється, when the reality is changing so, so rapidly, дуже швидко також змінюється мова. Language changes very rapidly as well. Я наведу вам приклад. I will give you an example. На початку full-scale invasion влада просила нас, просила українців робити світломаскування наших будинків. The government asked us to basically not, if we turn on the lights, then we have to kind of Block, block the lights so that the, any missiles that fly would not hit the house. 
світло, яке було чимось таким, що ми маємо, до чого ми звикли. Електрик світло, це було щось дуже звичайне, воно перетворилося на щось небезпечне. І були історії, наприклад, в Буча, Мій знайомий мені розповідав цю історію про те, як біля будинку його сусідів, коли він вийшов покорити, біля будинку його сусідів, спрацювало автоматичне вімкнення світла, датчик. І дуже швидко туди прилетіли снаряди. Of course, the missiles came there also. Тобто, дуже довго світло продовжувало бути чимось небезпечним. So, for a long while, the light has been something dangerous. Також, коли я їхала сюди, в поїзді провідниця просила нас закривати штори, щоб маскувати світло. Тобто, в поїзді провідниця просила нас закривати штори, щоб маскувати світло. Щоб було для нашої ж безпеки. Зараз Росія знищує електроінфраструктуру в Україні. І наші міста залишаються без світла. На дорогах, особливо вечора, дуже небезпечна ситуація. А мій чоловік кілька днів тому потрапив ДТП. На дорогах темно і без світла стало небезпечно. Світло стало такою якоюсь неймовірною розкішю. Одна річ, коли ти пишеш якийсь текст на весні 22-го року, і інша річ, коли ти пишеш текст весни, мова весь час змінюється, змінюється значення старих слів, і і доводиться щось пояснювати. Тексти швидко застарівають. Окрім того, є слова, які почали втрачати своє значення. Якщо ти вживаєш якесь слово багато разів, відбувається інфляція значення цього слова. Якщо ти вживаєш якесь слово багато разів, і теж треба розуміти, як використовувати такі слова. Але, окрім того, ми знаходимо якісь нові слова. Наприклад, у нас є таке слово, як «бавовна», «котон». Ми використовуємо це слово для того, щоб вибухи Вибухи, якщо українські військові влучають, наприклад, склади збройні окупантів. Справа в тому, що росіяни називають ці вибухи не вибухами, вони називають їх хлопками. Є певні державні документи, які регулюють, як преса має писати про все, що відбувається в Росії. І до повномасштабного вторгнення вони називали хлопками, вони називали вибухи газу в будинках. Але, насправді, «клеп» – це слово, яке використовувалося для експлозії натурального газу в будинках. Якщо перекласти слово «хлопок», 
з російською на українську. So if you translate the word, it's a, it's a, it, it, what they call a homonym, or that's a homonym, that хлопок. Homonym, yeah. Yeah, but it's just a homophone, so it sounds oh. the same, but it's two different words. So хлопок sound, if you put the stress on a different syllable, By it Google. becomes хлопок, it becomes uh, cotton. So, and sometimes Google Translate uh, does this, right? The, yes. This it mistranslates. It will be cotton. So that's why it became cotton uh, from that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. from that. Is, uh, inkoli, uh, Rus uh, росіяни, які беруть участь в інформаційній війні, вони користуються Google Translate. And oftentimes uh, those of the Russians who take part in the information war use Google Translate. Власне, це вони зробили цю помилку. And so they were the ones that uh, made this mistake. That they put the word хлопок, clap and the Google gave them хлопок, which is cotton. Якщо ви чули про Кримський мост і про цей вибух, що там... Якщо ви чули про Кримський мост і про цей вибух, що там... Якщо ви чули про Кримський мост і про цей вибух, що там... Це було коттон. Це було також коттон. Можливо, у кожного з вас є пральна машина. Або, наприклад, у кожного з вас правильно має вашу. Ви можете поставити режим коттон на ній. І ви можете поставити цей коттон режим там. Може, тоді українці швидше переможуть ці війни. Може, українці вирішують швидше, якщо ми це робимо. Це основні речі, які відбуваються з мовою, і навіть я бачу якийсь вплив і на англійську мову теж. І це є основні речі, які відбуваються з мовою, і я також бачу, що це часто впливає на англійську мову також. Наприклад, зараз, якщо я скажу, що Путін вийшов з нюклеар, це не буде означати те, що це означало колись. Бо якщо я скажу, що Путін вийшов з нюклеар, це не буде означати те, що це означало колись. Ви подумаєте про використання атомної зброї. Ви подумаєте про атомну зброю. You will think about the use of atomic weapons. Тобто страждають навіть ідіоми в англійській мові. So even the English idioms suffer. So I think we have time for maybe one more question, sir. Героям слава. So the question is, how does education continue uh, in these conditions of war in Ukraine, especially in the East? Um, the pandemic actually prepared us for this, the conditions of the war quite a bit. And, and I know that, I, and I think, and I don't just think, but I know that pandemics affected people here as well in education. Я знаю, що університети Харкова, наприклад, вони викладачі викладають онлайн. And for example, in the University of Kharkiv, the teachers, the professors teach online. Але не в усіх спеціальностях це можливо, скажімо так. І там, де це можливо, університети відкриті і університети працюють. And it's not always possible for all the majors and all the specialties. Wherever it's possible in terms of the specialties, the universities are open and they're working. And the same situation we have with schools. Yeah. So. That's, that's all. We had one more question, this last. Oh, okay, it's last okay, question. Last. <laughs> okay. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, please. Is, is there any aspect or topic of the war you find you can't write about? Uh, is there any aspect of the war that you find you cannot write about? Чи є якийсь аспект війни, про який ти відчуваєш, що ти писати не можеш? 
Я думаю, що я би не сказала, що не можу, але я думаю, що має бути певна техніка безпеки. But I do believe that there has to be some there have to be some security rules. Тому що такі речі, навіть як вірші, вони можуть теж травмувати або ретравматизувати людину. Because such things as poems can also traumatize or re-traumatize a person. Наприклад, я не можу читати деякі тексти, які я читала тут для вас. Я не можу читати їх в Україні, тому що це дуже буде боляче для моєї аудиторії. Some of the poems that I read for you today I cannot read in Ukraine because I know that it will be very painful for my audience. А я не хочу, щоб всі сиділи і плакали. And I don't want people to just sit there and cry. Також, коли я пишу тексти або там книжки, так, ви побачите, що ця книжка «Абрикос і Донбаси», вона закінчується хорошими історіями, веселими історіями. Ви бачите, що ця книжка, початку книжки, поеми, історії, які на кінці, це, насправді, якісь добрі історії, навіть жодні. Я думаю, що ця надія і цей фінал, позитивний фінал, він може теж допомогти читачу, особливо в Україні. Ці речі могли бути якимось такими дуже банальними і примітивними до війни. Але зараз це те, що може допомогти людям, і тому я вважаю, що ми повинні працювати в цьому напрямку. Of course, comedy narrative. If you could choose one narrative, tragic or comedy, which one would you choose? You keep it liberal. I already said. Oh, comedy narrative, of course. Okay. All right. We will prevail, I believe, in this, and we will have such such this like huge comedy narrative. After, of course, in in the when we win. Uh, well, thank you very much. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for Luba. Thank you.